Okay, so we're going to jump right in. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today uh, for one of many exciting events hosted by the Communication Design MFA program at Texas State. I'm Molly Sherman and I'd like to introduce Alice Lee. We're both assistant professors of communication design and graduate co-advisors of the MFA program at Texas State. Um, I'd like to thank Nikia Edmond, who helps us with many administrative tasks for the program, and Michael Niblett, the director of the School of Art and Design, and to all the faculty, staff, and students um, in our school for their support. We do ask that you mute, mute your audio to limit interruptions and distractions. You're welcome to, but not expected to, turn off your video during the lecture. We do ask, however, that you turn it back on if you're comfortable during the Q&A portion. And we will be recording this event um, and we'll share it um, through the Texas State Communication Design YouTube channel. So I'd like to introduce Kimberly Sutherland. Um, Kimberly is a designer, artist, and educator. Her art practice explores the interconnections between humans and nature by examining our relationships to place and its impact on our psyche. Kimberly is currently the design director of the King School Museum of Contemporary Art also known as KS Mocha, a museum housed inside of Dr. Martin Luther King Elementary School in Portland, Oregon, as well as the co-director of Recess, a graphic design studio class within KS Mocha. She was an adjunct professor of design and typography at Portland State University from 2016 to 2019, and now maintains a client-based design career, currently as an associate, associate creative director at design agency OMFG Co. She has formerly worked for the New York Times Magazine, Nike, Apple, and Project Projects, and with clients such as the Museum of Modern Art, Artist Space, and Gagosian Gallery. Her work has been shown in group exhibitions at the Sjekta Contemporary Art Center in Portland, Oregon, the Institute for Alice Moklia, sorry for <laughs> mispronunciation in Berlin, Germany, and Greensboro Project Space in Greensboro, North Carolina. She holds an MFA in Art and Social Practice from, the, from Portland State University and a Bachelor of Design from Emily Carr University of Art and, Des of Art and Design. Raised amongst the Cascade, uh, Canadian Cascades, Kimberly currently lives and works in Portland, Oregon. And it's with great pleasure and honor to invite Kimberly uh, to share her work with us today. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Molly and, and Alice for inviting me. I'm excited to speak with you all. I think I need to edit down my bio. It's way too long. <laughs> Sorry, Molly. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to share my screen and um, I have a presentation I've prepared for you all. And, and then we'll have questions after. So book design and collective futures is the topic that we're going to discuss today. The frame. Oh, I got to move my Zoom people one second. There we go. All right, so hello. Let's talk about creative practice and book design as a way of strengthening connections to people and places. I like to think about it as encountering life in action. Um, so my practice now encompasses or embodies all of these different ways of working. Um, it definitely took a while to get to this place, um, but it's important for me to have these sort of like intersecting lines in my practice and not have it just be one thing. Um, but before we get into where I'm at now, I'd like to take you back to the beginning. And my beginning starts with failure. Never... Uh, necessarily a bad thing, not necessarily a bad thing. So this is me in grade six in 1992 with my brother. Very cool. Um, and in grade six, I got a D in art class and it was the worst grade I ever got in my career as a student. And I just decided at that point that I would never be an artist, that I was bad at art and I would never take an art class. So I went through junior high and I went through high school and I never took an art class. Um, I did find different ways of being creative. I took ceramics and I took photography, but I stayed very far away from anything that resembled drawing or painting or anything like that. Um, and then in my early 20s, I started feeling like I wanted to be creative and I discovered this magazine that totally put me on a different trajectory 
that kind of started where I'm at now. It's called Tokyo Magazine, and it was out of、um, New York and Tokyo. And every issue was like its own little art gallery. It had these handmade title treatments that changed all the time. It reflected different artists from all over the world, some established, some emerging. And it was just this representation of this community, and I got really excited about what this could offer. I realized at that point that I could use book design as a tool for community engagement, for creative exchange, and as an outlet for my creativity without necessarily calling myself an artist because that word scared me. So I had kind of found a loophole. So、um, in 2003, I took matters into my own hands and I started making my own publication. And it's very embarrassing to look at now, but in 2003, it was cool.、Um, it was called Manic Magazine, and it was a、uh, it was a look at different creative makers and artists in Vancouver, BC, which is where I was, where I'm from, and where I was living. And it none of the it didn't have any sort of theme.、Um, it Encompassed all of these different things, from photography to short stories to poetry, to conceptual art.、Um, there was painting and drawing. There were interviews,、um, but it was a way for me to connect to the creative community and、um, be able to show people's work and be able to use design in order to do that. And that felt really exciting to me. What that offered. Here's some very funny spreads from that zine, and I would have these launch parties, and it was it was really fun. Um, so at that point, I was like, "Okay, design. This is this is cool. I'm interested." So I decided to go to、um, university. So my undergrad I did at Emily Carr in Vancouver, and I was looking for this path forward.、Um, and honestly, the program that I was in, I didn't find very inspiring. It wasn't what I was looking for. The way that I was thinking about design and this like、um, sort of connection with community and collaboration, it more was focused on advertising, and that was not something I felt passionate about. And it wasn't until my fourth year of the program that I finally found my way. After going on exchange to Berlin, which kind of blew my mind open as to what design could be. I came home and I was struggling with thinking of what a thesis project might be.、Um, I really wanted to find something I was excited about, and I remember sitting in my apartment one day and I pulled this book off my shelf that a friend had given me maybe a year before, and I'd never looked at. And I opened it up, and it had this inscription that was like, "Broadcast this, these teachings like trumpets to the world" or something. And I was like, "Oh, what is that?" And then、um, as I started reading it, I was like, "This is it. I found my thing." So. Buckminster Fuller was an American architect. If you don't know, he was an author, a designer, an inventor, and an educator. And he talked a lot about um, systems thinking. Um, this is a quote that really got me excited about doing this project that I'm going to show you. We are not going to be able to operate our spaceship Earth successfully, nor for much longer, unless we see it as a whole spaceship and our fate as common. It has to be everybody or nobody. So this idea of interconnection, of collaboration, of working together, humans and nature was like that blew my mind. So I this is what I wanted to talk about. This is what I wanted to do my thesis about, and I decided to.、Um, I was asking myself these questions. So can design expand outside of how I've been taught to understand it, and can it include education, experience, exchange, collaboration, and research? My undergrad program would have said maybe no, but the answers are yes and yes. So I、um, got in touch with a local high school and、I、ended up doing an eight-session、um, workshop series with them. And I taught them about systems thinking, and I taught them about Buckminster Fuller, and、um, we did a little、uh, multimedia installation together. And as I was doing this workshop series. I was also collecting a lot of sort of secondary research around different artists and creatives and thinkers, educators that were using this idea of systems thinking in their work somehow.、Um, and I got gathered a bunch of excerpts from that research, and I made this silkscreen newspaper called "Everybody or Nobody," that was sort of a reflection of these different ways of working, but all within this context of thinking about interconnection.、Um, and it was. I made and I made this little、uh, 
sort of environment, reading environment for my um, thesis exhibition that people could go and read the books in. And it was the funnest project I'd ever worked on. I was so jazzed about it. And it actually is um, the project. Oh yeah, so I started to understand publishing as a radical action at that point. And the fact that it can reflect conceptual thinking, it can communicate ideas to a mass audience, and it can combine all the ways of working that feel meaningful to me, education, exchange, collaboration, research, writing, design, and publishing. Um, so I figured out that I can use this material form as my canvas and that maybe I am an artist. Um, and that book, actually, that, that publication led me to New York, where I got my first design job at Project Projects. And I got that job because Molly um, actually left that position to move to Portland to do the art and social practice MFA program, which I later then followed her to. Um, so off I went to New York. Um, and while I was there, I worked a lot with book design and I learned about typography and I learned about content and I learned about how to use space and how um, all these different ways that uh, design needs to be in collaboration with content and form. So this like sort of intentional interconnection between these elements and the content is incredibly important to make a book good in my opinion. Uh, so I learned a lot there and it was very beneficial, um, worked a lot with cultural institutions um, and then I went on to work at the New York Times Magazine. And that was, um, I learned a lot there too in a different way. So having the boundaries of you have to use this typeface, you have to use this template. Um, how can you make interesting layouts with that within, within those confines every week? Uh, and that was, um, and also very much collaborative between the editorial department and the photography department um, and all of these different uh, designers. So that was really interesting. So my career was going great. New York was good to me, but I felt kind of uninspired by all of it. I really wanted to focus more on the process of developing content through building relationships than I did on producing books. Um, and I couldn't shake the desire for um, introducing these kind of intersecting lines into my work. I just really yearned for a more experiential approach. I also really missed seeing far distances because if you spend a lot of time in New York, as Molly might know, it's hard to actually see the sky. Um, and being from the West Coast, I missed that a lot. So I decided to quit everything and I uh, took the time to develop a practice, which led me from my job in Times Square at the Times to Portland State University, where I became a student, a graduate student in the art and social practice program. Uh, where we did stuff like this. <laughs> we had to do little exercises every morning that um, one person was in charge of. And sometimes it took the form of weird dancing. But that's all part of it. So when I entered that program, I was thinking about, um, you know, how can I explore this concept of interconnection that I've been kind of thinking about since the everybody or nobody newspaper, this kind of systems thinking approach. How can I explore that and use design as a way of collaborating with diverse publics and places? Um, and I'll say that for the first year of that program, I was pretty burnt out on design from, I mean, yeah, working so much in New York beyond the jobs I had. I also was doing freelance work and um, I think I just overdid it a little bit. So it, as of my second year in the program, I finally got into um, but I got back to publications. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is um, Creek College. So Creek College was an experimental school that offered art classes in exchange for environmental restoration. So what we would do is we would choose a waterway that suffered from some sort of environmental degradation, which are a lot of them, sadly. And we would invite artists in the area to teach classes on the site. And the classes could range from anything. It, it was really open. There were poetry classes, there were sculpture classes, there were um, bookmaking classes. Um, but the idea was, and anyone could take the classes for free and, and like they didn't cost any money, but you had to do a barter 
in um, a restoration barter. So every class had a restoration activity you had to do in exchange for taking the class. Um, here's just a few pictures of the first one we did was at the Johnson Creek in Portland, Oregon. And yeah, there were different conversations. There was um, a class about how much water gets displaced when you step into it, a scientific experiment. Uh, there was sculpture and yeah, bookmaking. There was a sound class, tons of stuff. And then the second session we did was a two part session and it was on the Columbia Slough. Um, and that is also in Portland, Oregon. And we did it in collaboration with NEA, which is the Native American Youth and Family Center based in Portland um, on the site. They, they, their building is on the edge of this creek, this slough. Um, and we did one in the spring and we did one in the fall. And again, invited artists to um, submit proposals to teach classes and all the artists get a stipend for teaching and also a materials budget. Um, and yeah, all these different things happened. There was a si silent canoe ride, there was performance, there was discussions, um, there was a class about apples. There were, uh, there was like a medicinal herbs class taught by one of the um, indigenous teachers at the school. Um, and as a, we had gotten a grant for that project and part of the fulfillment of the grant was that we had to um, produce a printed document of the project. So my interest was, okay, how can I push beyond expectations of what a printed document might look or sound like, i.e. who's telling the story, instead of just doing what one might expect. Um, and I was really inspired by Aspen Magazine, um, which some of you may know, it was a, a magazine that was around in the 60s. And every issue was different. It was always unbound and it came in a, some sort of case and it held all different types of things um, from art pieces to records to different ephemera from different people. That one in the bottom um, left corner is the cover was done by Andy Warhol. And I was really inspired by this idea of all of these pieces, all of these, this sort of like collage of people's ideas coming together in this one form to be a book, even though it wasn't bound like a traditional book would be bound. So um, I wanted to make the publication collaborative and center the voices of the artists that taught the classes. Instead of just having our ideas, like the me, myself and Adam um, Carlin and Christina were the collaborators that started Creek College. And um, we didn't wanna just have our voices in there. so. We wanted to center the, the artists. Um, so it became this sort of collage of reflections and scores for future engagement with the site from the artists who participated. So this is what, what the end result was. It came in this sort of envelope that was silk screened and there were all these different pieces included. Um, I did do some reso printing uh, about Creek College that also had the sort of schedule of events in there. Um, there were there was maps of the site, like old maps and new maps. There were photographs. And then there were pieces by all of the different artists. Um, and they could submit whatever they wanted. So it just in relationship to the project. So some people submitted to-do lists. Some people submitted um, scores for interacting with the creek. Um, some people submitted drawings or writing. Um, these little booklets we gave out everyone. Everyone got a notebook on the day of the event in order to take um, notes during the day. And we collected all of those and sort of um, took excerpts out of them and made one little book that had a, was a reflection of a bunch of different people's experience from the day. So yeah, that was really fun. And I printed, like everything was printed on different papers, as you can see, different colors, different textures, different paper stocks, and um, was sort of a representation of all of these different people coming together um, for the project and it got sent out to all of the people involved. Um, so my next project is We Construct Marvels Between Monuments. And this actually was a client project. Um, and it took place, uh, it was an exhibition catalog for Portland Art Museum and it came out in um, 2019. 
And it was five exhibitions with emerging and established artists examining how museums historically have granted access to art and knowledge and what the future of the institution could look like. So it covered visual art, performance, screenings, and discussions. Um, and I was hired to do the book design, but I also did um, some of the sort of design flyers and things like that for the actual show. And every show, so we construct marvels between monuments, every word was one exhibition. Um, and they, they, we also brought in artists to do wayfinding. So there was this wayfinding mural that went through the, through the um, institution that led people up to the gallery where we were. Um, there was furniture that was made for it. There was, uh, we hired an, an artist who did, like works with plants um, and they brought in plants so that there was life inside. There was a stage built in the middle that was kind of a centerpiece for all the exhibitions. Um, and every uh, show had a different um, curator that was invited to curate the show. And it was all photographed differently. Um, it was quite a, in the end, I had quite a cacophony of, of um, ephemera to deal with, different degrees of quality, which makes um, making a cohesive exhibition catalog a little bit challenging. Um, so here's some images from We. So the We show um, was uh, working with artists with developmental disabilities and showing their work. And there were lots of different performances that took place and discussions um, that happened throughout. Um, Construct was working with these um, black radical performance artists. And uh, yeah, the gallery got like very, um, as you can see on that bottom right side, it got vandalized pretty intensely. That's a whole nother story. Um, Marvels was the third one, and that was working with um, high school students in the area to, that was actually um, working on this project called Not MoMA. So this, the high school students were recreating works that are part of the um, permanent collection of the MoMA art institution. And those were shown in the gallery. And again, more performances and different events that were happening. So there was this ongoing um, way of sort of activating the institutional space that is not normally um, activated in that way. It was very full of life. Um, and then between was working with trans artists and we had a drag ball and there were lots of different like cool performances that took place as part of that as well. And then Monuments was a show about Sun Ra and we actually had the Sun Ra Orchestra come and um, do a performance and it was really incredible. So it was all of Sun Ra's, um, a, lo a lot of his ephemera. So for me, my task was, okay, at the end, I got all of this content from all of these different shows that were photographed by different people. Um, so there was not a lot of consistency over all of it. So thinking about how can the design honor and reflect the reality of marginalized artist experiences or lack of within the museum model. Um, I think this exhibition series really gave these artists an, an opening to take up space in the museum. So I was thinking about the design, you know, I was like, okay, you know, how can I use typography or um, the compositions or, and to think about this concept of like getting big, filling in holes and making it a place where anyone can see themselves in. So um, I took the reflection part pretty literally and on the cover, I did this like mirrored foil that you could literally see yourself in when you look at it. Um, and then I chose type that had a super family. So it had very wide style and it had very condensed style. So this idea of like, taking up space and like fitting in wherever you can was reflected in the typographic choices I was making. Um, and then the serif that I chose was Stanley. So, and Stanley is a sort of redraw of Times New Roman. So it was this taking this classic sort of established typeface that everyone knows and um, re, re looking at it, um, which is what was happening with this exhibition. So here's some spreads 
from the exhibition. And um, I used color to sort of separate the five different exhibitions that took place. Yeah, that was really a fun project. Okay, and then on to rural. I'm just flying through this. So this is um, my most recent and ongoing project, but started back in 2016. As you may remember, there was a pretty intense election that took place. Um, so because of the election that took place in 2016, I was sort of just witnessing this growing narrative around the urban rural divide and sort of pitting these two communities against each other. And I was, I, I just wanted to find a way to use design um, to investigate that because I know I come from a very small town in Canada, um, a rural town. And though I live in, in cities now, I live in urban places. I know that that's, you, you can't paint communities in black and white like that. Like there's nuances that are being lost in these divisions. Um, so rural is a site specific publication that um, is an exploration of the urban rural divide and the concept of interdependence through the lens of publication design. Um, every issue takes place in a different rural location. Um, the first issue took place in Joseph, Oregon. And the last issue, which just came out literally two weeks ago, um, was in New Cuyama, California, which I will tell you where it is in a minute because nobody knows. Also, I don't know if you think, like look at adding up that New Cuyama sign, it makes no sense. It's very funny. Um, so, uh, the way that it works is that uh, every, so every issue takes place in a different rural community and it, I place myself as an artist in residence at a place of lodging in that town. So in Joseph, it was at the Jennings Hotel, which is seen here. And there's a little map so you can see where Joseph is. It's um, almost in Idaho, in Eastern Oregon. And this project took place from 2017 to 2018. So here's the first issue. Um, so the way that it works is I, I go to these towns, I spend time getting to know people that have lived there for a long time and doing various things with them. So sometimes we'll go for a walk or I've helped people on their farms. Um, I've gone on road trips with people, lots of meals at people's houses. I went on this crazy 10 mile run in the snowy mountains with this other person and I don't run and I didn't die somehow. So that was great. Um, so I have experiences with people, I get to know them and uh, I interview them and I take photographs. And then all these books, I design these books and they live in the rooms of the hotel permanently and also with all of the participants um, and then also in the local library. And then all of the places that I work in, all of the different towns, the people become um, subscribers. So they get any future or past issues of the book which is, it, it kind of becomes this connection point which, between rural places. Um, so this, and the launch party is also a big part of the project. Um, for Joseph, the launch party we did, um, I led a silent walk through this um, indigenous heritage site. And then we had a very fun square dance party and dinner where all the people came. And I never knew the square dancing was so fun. It was so fun. Highly recommend. Um, and so for issue two in uh, New Koyama, so there's New Koyama you can see in the bottom left corner. Um, it's about two hours north of LA. Uh, it's a really interesting town that was built. Um, it really was built up in 1950 because there was a huge oil strike there and what is now Arco um, built this whole community to house all the people that worked um, for the oil company. And then the oil company left and, um, and the town kind of didn't change that much. So it feels a little bit like a time warp. I'm gonna read you the introduction in, in a minute and we'll get into that a little bit more. But it's a really cool town and there's one hotel in the town called Koyama Buckhorn. And um, I was invited to do a residency there in 2019. And um, so, I'm, I, yeah, I, I'm always thinking about the context and the design, no matter what project I do, whether it's a client project or a personal project. 
I really want to think about how these books will be discovered, where they might be read. Um, so for rural, you know, people are finding them in their rooms of their hotels, so they may be reading them in their beds. Um, they're usually tourists from out of town that are just visiting, like either passing through or visiting for a few days and maybe don't know the place that well. Um, so there's this kind of intimacy in the project. Um, and also the ways that I'm interacting with the people that are part of it feels very um, intimate in a way. It's, there's a closeness, you know, I'm in their homes, we're in cars together, we're having conversations about life. Um, so I was thinking about that when I'm making the books uh, and, and also thinking about wanting them to be accessible and for the design and the materiality to reflect the environments and the feeling of the project. So the colors represent the places um, in different ways. The first, the first issue, um, I was kind of representing the color of the lake in the town. This most recent issue is a reflection of the sort of um, high desert sandy dustiness um, and you know choosing an American type face that feels accessible nothing too trendy um, and wanting the the book to feel like you can hold it in your hands it's it's not too cumbersome the texture of the paper has like a um, it has a soft texture to it you can feel this kind of there's like a tactility that happens that I really think is important. Um, also, the most recent issue uh, in New Koyama, New Koyama has almost half the population is um, Hispanic. And so I um, hired a translator and made the book bilingual because I wanted it to be accessible to the whole community. And this is the most recent one that came out. Um, I'm going to read you guys the introduction because I think it does a good job of kind of like re reflecting the project as a whole. Um, and I'm going to flip just to the next page so you can see some images of some of the people here while I read it. So rural is a document of conversations and experiences with people living in rural communities. It explores lived experience framed by the questions, how does where we live shape our reality and impact how we relate to ourselves, our communities, the environment, our politics, and the ways we are creative? How and why do people make meaningful contemporary lives in rural places? How can urban and rural people build mutually beneficial relationships? And what, what role does tourism potentially have in cultivating that kind of conscious interdependence? The series of books about people in place is less about definitively answering those questions and more about spending time with them. It's a social practice that explores concepts of caring, community, contradiction, otherness, interdependence, history, the land's effect on psyche, and our various interpretations of freedom. It is a glimpse into some of the lives that help form and inform a place and how a place shapes its people. Hopefully it will serve as a generative primer for building mutually beneficial relationships between people on both sides of the urban rural divide and those who straddle the two worlds. For the local community, I offer it as a reverent reflection of their wisdom and experiences. For visitors, it can be an idiosyncratic guide to reconnecting with ways of living that are rooted in a reciprocal relationship to land and place. Each book in the series is focused on the experiences of specific local individuals living in a community and is not meant to represent the community as a whole. Nestled on State Route 166 between the coastal town of Santa Maria and the country music epicenter of Bakersfield is a small unincorporated town of New Koyama. It's a special place where from an outsider's perspective, time almost seems to stand still and urban anxieties go to die. Framed by three coastal mountains, uh, three coastal mountain ranges, the Los Padres National Forest, the Carrizo Plain, the largest single native grassland we're meeting in California, lies this picturesque dry desert landscape surprisingly sprinkled with the greenest fields you can imagine. Located on the traditional lands of the Chumash tribe, the name Koyama comes from the word Koyam, which in Chumash language means both repose or to sit and wait, as it was a place where their people would rest when out gathering food. New Koyama population 517 was developed in the early 1950s by the Atlantic Richfield Oil Company, now ARCO, after discovering a massive oil field in the area. 
They built houses, businesses, a small airport, mostly a landing strip, and a school to house all the workers and their families. Once the oil ran out, the industry moved on, but the infrastructure, many of the people and the culture lives on. The industry is now predominantly centered on cattle and agriculture. It's a quaint and peaceful town that feels a bit like traveling back in time to a place where kids rule the streets and cowboys tip their hats when they greet you. In the summer of 2019, I spent three weeks doing an artist residency at the one and only hotel and bar in town called Koyama Buckhorn. My days were spent exploring the area and visiting with farmers, cowboys, and longtime community members. Our conversations took place in an array of settings, including bouncing along in farm trucks, inside baby goat pens and chicken coops, in living rooms, over meals, and almost on horseback. Dick Gibford, page 132, had to rain check at the last minute, but I have high hopes that it's still going to happen. If you haven't read the first issue of Rural, it's important to say I'm not from this area. I'm from a small town in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia. It's larger than New Koyama, but shares a history of thriving industry. In my hometown, it was logging uh, and is now more focused on cattle and agriculture. Our main crop is corn. In Koyama, it's carrots. Making, making work about a place I'm not from is complicated. I'm constantly asking myself who this work is for and who is benefiting from it. This project has multiple audiences, local people, tourists, often from urban, urban places, and people who live in other rural communities throughout North America. As this series expands over time, each participant will become a free subscriber and receive copies of all past and future issues and a copy will be donated to each featured community's local library. This enables the books to become a point of connection between diverse rural communities and the array of visitors they welcome. The Rural Series is a proposal for engagement. It started after the 2016 election when I noticed the growing narrative of divisiveness trickling into the mainstream, pitting rural and urban communities against each other. There's a loss of nuance in these divisions and I couldn't see a way forward without listening to each other. I still can't. What I'm learning as I develop and build relationships with people living in rural places through this project is that we're all making decisions based on our realities, our communities, and our cultures. Our perspectives are formed by what and who is around us, and those perspectives are often understood as truth, my own included. Which leads me to understand reality is subjective, none more true than the other. I'm interested in exploring the peripheries of our realities and in defining my own and pushing outside of it. These conversations took place a year ago, and this issue was put on hold because of the global pandemic. We're still trapped in as of fall 2020. Now, one month away from another election, everything feels more charged and weighted than it did in 2016, which makes this project feel even more crucial to me. If ever there is a time to truly acknowledge our shared humanity and center the idea of relational interdependence, it is now. So that's the introduction from the second issue. Um, the first issue had uh, obviously was more focused on Joseph, but shared um, the same language about the questions I was asking and things like that. Um, oh, I wanted to share this video with you guys. I'd never seen this before, but you never know what you're going to find in these places. Um, racing with lawnmowers. Anybody? So funny. That was a July 4th event. Um, I just love being in these places so much. Uh, so this was the launch party that I had for the second issue, which just took place a week and a half ago in Nukoyama. I was down there. Um, and obviously it had to have a very different tone than the first one did because of the situation and reality that we're in. Um, but I was able to at least have some of the participants there and we were able to have a socially distanced event and um, dinner. And I invited um, Carmen Sandoval, who's in the book, and she's uh, a traditional Chumash teacher and the Chumash are, that's the, um, the land that uh, New Koyama is on now. So she um, opened with a sort of grounding um, land acknowledgement. And then um, Blanca, who was my translator, spoke um, about her experience and work on the project. And then I read the introduction and we had a dinner and it was, it was lovely. I hope to be able to go back and have a raging party with them at some point. Um, so where I've kind of landed is that uh, 
The creation of content through exploring new places and meeting new people is the most exciting part of this project for me. That's like, that's like where my heart lies in it is really getting to build relationships with people and hear their stories and um, listen to their experiences and um, be immersed in their communities uh, and, and have conversations. It's not, I'm not, I am listening, but I'm also, you know, talking about my, my points of view. Um, and some, sometimes the conversations are really hard but there's value in that too. And there's value in having a hard conversation and being able to just like hear each other and agree to disagree. Um, yeah, uh, so even though the, the experience of relationship building is like the most exciting part for me, the book is also, it plays an equally important role of course in the project. So it's the piece that celebrates the place and shares the experiences and communicates the project out to the world that's ultimately what gets people excited to even talk to me. You know, I'm literally often cold calling people that are friends with someone that suggested I talk to this person. And for the most part, everyone is incredibly welcoming and generous with their time um, and interested in maybe being part of a, a book project and having their stories exist in print. Um, I'm also looking for my next location. If anybody has any suggestions, open to that. Um, so that's my journey. I think I'm like very under time. Am I? Oh, no, I'm okay. Um, so my failure of being a good artist at 12 led me to design and using book design and publishing as a space for building relationships with people and place has become my art practice. So failure can lead to good things, turns out. Um, and I wanted to just end on this quote, which I love, which is, um, when we encounter the authentic whole, we encounter life at work and we are transformed by passive observers to active participants in ways that intellectual understanding can never achieve. And that's it. Thank you.